Uh, so hello everyone and welcome to uh, our Power of Pride webinar um, with the really uh, great topic today of why Pride matters. Um, Fujitsu uh, Global Pride are hosting what is our first virtual Pride week with a series of events uh, from the 22nd to the 26th of June this year. Um, today on, on our panel to discuss why Pride matters, uh, we've got four great, well, five great panelists actually who are joining us uh, on, on four video screens as we go through. Uh, the first one, uh, we have Alex and, and Miloš, who are board members of Fabrika Rovniski uh, from Poland and from Łódź, which is a really great city for uh, Fujitsu uh, uh, in our global network as well. Secondly, we have Andrew Richardson, uh, who's the head of digital global, global marketing for Fujitsu. And thirdly, we have Jose Plans, who's the director of engineering for Citrix. Uh, and finally, Roland White, uh, who's no relation, the, the two White brothers uh, here, Tim White and Roland White, um, who is the Director of Global Diversity and Inclusion for One Microsoft International. So why don't we kick off and maybe I'll start uh, with uh, sort of framing the first discussion point uh, and something that could be seen maybe as a little controversial given uh, our topic today, which is, you know, do we think that pride uh, still matters? And you know, while the actual state of the LGBT plus uh, rights vary greatly by country as we go along, uh, go around the world, there has been you know a, a lot of progress that's been made. And some may say that the legal recognition in many countries has somewhat d diminished the uh, the need or the drive or the passion or the value of pride. And uh, on that topic. Uh, I'd be really, really keen to get Alex and Miloš to, uh, to, to give us their views uh, on how they feel about that. Okay, so hello, nice to be here with you. Uh, leading on why pride still matters and why legal recognition may have diminished its importance, I would love to say that even though in many countries around the world there has been recognition, both legal and simply social recognition. It doesn't change the fact that acceptance as such and recognition of LGBT plus community around the world has not reached its best, I would say, because there are still countries in the, in the world that do not provide legal recognition, do not provide uh, education that would promote tolerance and simply even though in countries where there is recognition, where there is acceptance, there are still people who simply are not educated enough, are not aware enough to see LGBT plus community, to see us as a significant part of the community that should be accepted, that should be loved, that should have floor to speak, to be active, to do things. And tackling recent events in the United States, uh, Black Lives Matter movement shows that even though since many years before we have been fighting for the rights and it's supp supposedly 21st century and we shouldn't be fighting for that anymore, there are still people that I don't know how to put it, they still kill because of color of other people's skin. There are still crimes against LGBT plus communities. And even though women's rights have been recognized internationally, there are still sexist people around the world. So we still have to be visible. We still have to promote it and simply educate people because by being visible, I believe we can show an ex as being us being example is the greatest tool to educate people. Um, even though we've been fighting for equal rights for so many years, there are still countries where you can um, get the penalty of death even for just being uh, the way are you uh, as you are, just loving differently. Uh, for example, in Poland, the recognition, uh, legal recognition of LGBTQ uh, community is so not perfect. Um, but the pride isn't all about the legal acts and legal uh, taking actions legally and introducing new law. Uh, it's also about raising awareness about the people, about our people, about the 
uh, equality in general, the sexuality, different sexual orientations, uh, about the tolerance in general. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that we are not even uh, halfway past, even yeah. though we've been fighting for those rights for so many years. <clears throat> Uh, so yeah, definitely pride still matters, and I think uh, nowadays uh, in the world of fake news, uh, demonization, uh, pride is, mm, I think, one of the most important events during the year. Yeah, oh, I have yeah. to agree. Yeah, me. I completely agree. Yeah, I think um, for for me, uh, I, I really embrace. There's a there's a a line or a term that we've been using quite a lot through our pride network, which is this be completely yourself. And I think adding to what you were just saying uh, there as well, it's not just about being completely yourself, but it's being valued for being completely mm. yourself as well, which is a really important thing. But uh, yeah, great, great points. Maybe Roland, um, if, if you wanted to add on to that, and I'll just sort of throw a topic to say, so how do you feel when you see the different pride events happening around the world, particularly in areas where, where LGBT plus people have fewer rights? Yeah, so, so from Microsoft's perspective, as, as a global organization that operates in over 190 countries, the topic of LGBT plus is quite an interesting topic. Um, I think as our colleagues just mentioned, I mean, when we look around the world, there's, I think there's something like 72 countries at last count where um, there weren't legal rights or legal protection for different members of the LGBT community. And even six of those countries um, still have the death penalty. Um, and that is just for being who you are and who you love and who you choose to love. Um, and so as I talk to my son a lot about this, it's, it's, it's just amazing that still in this world that we still have to judge other people based on who they're born and who they're meant to be and, and we're not more open. And so in our work, as we, we look around the world, we, we really encourage both in Microsoft and with our, our channel partners to um, embrace diversity as a whole and to really challenge the stereotypes around the world about what we mean for diversity. So one of the things that we, we are particularly proud of and drive towards is to support countries where either legally or culturally, which is the other part of this, this dis, um, discussion that we have, um, the LGBT plus topic is not accepted or as acceptable. Um, we want to make statements, we want to make visible commitments to the community. Um, and so for my peers in, in Poland, I mean, our, our general manager, uh, Mark Lochran, um, he marched in the Pride Parade this last year and had such interesting feedback from different customers from Poland about what does that mean? What doesn't that mean? Why is Microsoft putting its brand um, to this topic? And for me, I think the more an organization can put a brand to pride parades, not just that in that moment in time, but pride as a whole throughout the year, because I had a brilliant quote last week that change happens in between these moments, um, then we can help break down society, we can help influence society, and whether it's through those moments like the pride parade or whether it's embedding different education and dialogue into our, our channel partner and client network on this topic, all of these are moments that matter that to help break down the stigma and to include other people, not just those that are, are truly identify as the LGBT plus topic, but looking left and right. Because when you talk about sexual orientation, when you talk about gender identity and gender expression, that is the whole planet. So how do we break this down and bring everybody together? Well, Tim, you're on mute. Yeah, that's a great point there, Roland. I think, um, uh, you know, I, it's speaking to our, our president, Takita-san, in, in Japan. He, he's very focused on purpose-driven organisations. And uh, for us, it's, it's very much about a co contribution to society. And when I look at Microsoft, uh, and you might have to help me with the exact term, but it's basically about making a difference to everyone everywhere. And I think sort of your points really map, uh, map into that theme, that it is about everyone everywhere, uh, not about one country or another country uh, in that way. Really, yeah. Um, yeah, which is probably a really good handover to sort of start to maybe take a bit of a corporate uh, theme of this as well. And uh, maybe, uh, Jose, you can help us out here. What, uh, what role do you see that corporations have to play in LGBT plus inclusion? I would say, I would, say I would define them in, maybe, and this is my personal opinion, into two, two buckets. One is the enablers and the other one is a bit the 
advocate uh, side. Um, so a bit, a bit on, I mean, Roland put it very well, right? In the sense that, you know, if in the world, of, I mean, and based on the first conversation we had, um, it's all about those minorities that still exist, that that they need a voice, that they need inclusion, they need belonging. And and the role that we have, I think, personally in, in the corporate side is that, A, we, we welcome you, we want you, you know, and, 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 and we want you to be safe in this environment. Um, and so, for example, um, in Citrix, at least, uh, I mean, many other companies have done, but, but the, the one thing I, I really liked, and by the way, I joined Citrix one year and a half ago, so I'm kind of still newbie in the company, but one warm uh, feeling I had was to come in and see uh, rainbow flags in the office, uh, mm. having ERGs, which are the uh, employee resource groups, right? To build communities and reaching out and saying, hey, do you want to be part of this? Uh, and, and, and seeing all this involvement in different uh, communities or, 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 or charities. And I thought, wow, I can make a difference here. Whereas, you know, throughout my upbringing, um, I, always, I was always shy about me. I didn't want to come out, you know, I was worried, you know, with Spain and so, um, so the role I think as leaders in, in, the, in, in the corporate or those, or those companies is just to make sure that it just doesn't matter who you love. It doesn't matter. What matters is that, are you happy? Do you want to, to be successful? Um, can we help you and those that you love to be happy in this world and, 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 and move forward, right? Progress towards, towards that happiness. And unfortunately, uh, to, your, to the point of the pride is that unfortunately we are not there yet, right? Uh, mm. You know, there's many employees, for example, that, that, that are shy about being themselves. And, and we need to make sure that through us leaders, uh, showing through example, that they can talk to us and at any moment in time without any discrimination or prejudice. Um, and so I guess it's about making that safety environment, uh, that belonging environment, and just making sure that we actually campaign for that, that freedom of speech, that freedom of being ourselves. Um, and then obviously there's many dimensions there about how we get to, to do that, but I guess, I guess we, <laughs> we have more time for that after. Yeah, no, 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 that's great, Jose. I think um, you were sort of, you're hitting on a, a really um, important point for me there, which is that um, I, so I love the word pride because, it, you know, what, what you've been talking about there is not about being kind of uh, radical or different or anything like that. It's about being proud. And I think that's the message that, uh, you know, we're trying to say, yes, please. I can see <laughs> Eli just put his hand up. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add that uh, today we can observe a situation when, um, Mm. companies and uh, yeah companies uh, may be considered as stakeholders when it comes to human rights and they have a real power and impact uh, to make the situation better or worse uh, because often uh, the internal regulations and rules inside those uh, companies are the only rules that mm, I don't know can shape uh, the situation for those people and they can uh, apart from the corporations being a huge uh, lobby backstage uh, those rules can actually shape the, um, uh, the minds of the people yep. inside the corporation and outs and can influence their, their life outside the company so for example the person who, who works in a LGBT friendly uh, environment even though uh, they are not LGBT on themselves, uh, can then learn something and make wiser decision when it comes to LGBT com community, uh, for example, when it comes to um, elections. Yeah, yeah, great point. And I think that uh, was actually one of the topics I was going to raise later as well, which is the importance of allies uh, as well as we go through. And I think, Milos, what you're saying there as well is the importance of allies in leadership uh, as yeah. well and maybe just uh, to, to bring Andrew into the conversation I'd be really interested Andrew on what your views are on sort of the importance of leadership um, as we as we talk about this topic yeah I think um, I personally think that part of being a leader is to create a culture of openness and respect and that isn't just for LGBT plus people, but for everyone, everyone should feel comfortable. Everyone should be able to go to work and not feel scared or not feel like they're not part of um, the community there. 
And I think senior leaders have uh, a task there to try and create that culture, especially if you're in virtual teams like we are now. Yeah. Um, it's sometimes quite difficult to, to get to something that works. Um, for me, having worked with many different people um, across Fujitsu, for example, uh, I think the best leaders are the ones that educate themselves and um, are mindful of how they communicate and sort of act as a role model. Um, as someone said earlier on, actually being at Fujitsu and seeing people walking around with a rainbow lanyard is fine when it's just people you know, but seeing a very senior person do that does make you feel comfortable. And I think doing that and acting as a role model is a really great step, um, as is, as I say, educating yourself. And if you're not sure, um, coming to a community, an LBT, LGBT network, and asking a question, if you're not sure, you, we need to create open spaces within organizations, not just for LGBT people, but also for people who want to learn. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, a few of the comments that were brought up uh, previously are around Pride as well. And um, I'm sure that when we talk about corporations at Pride, it's like, well, are they actually doing anything? Are they just using it as a chance to promote their organization? And I think a lot of the time they are because there is a, an LGBT network there that's fought to get them at Pride. And I think there's just that, uh, are they doing the next step? Are they doing something beyond Pride as well? I completely agree. Now, just bear with me one second, Andrew, because <laughs> now, go? I, I'm coming to you today from my home. Now, I, <laughs> I don't have much of a need for a lanyard in my home, but I thought maybe I'd put my lanyard on after you made Perfect. your comment there. Very good, very good. Now, um, Roland, I'm, I'm really interested in, in your opinions. Um, about, I suppose, what are two words which are, which are used uh, as we talk across the whole theory of diversity and inclusion, and they are exactly those words, diversity and inclusion. And traditionally, there's a focus sort of more on building a diversity first approach, but now the push is very much going to inclusion first uh, in there. Uh, how do you feel about that sort of, uh, let's say, interplay between words that exist? Okay, so, um... It's, it's, tough a, it's, question. It's, it's, a, it's a tough question and I kind of got my head to kind of bridge between Jose and Andrew on the leadership and brand thing, but I'll get, I'll get it in there in a second. But I, what, why I'm kind of bringing this up is I think the challenge at the moment is too many people are running very quickly into inclusion and belonging without actually truly understanding what diversity is. Um, and I feel even now, if we did a poll to different people on this call, we'd all have a different definition of what diversity is. And too often we, we stay on one characteristic of diversity and not truly understand the complexity of every single human being. And so why this is important from a Microsoft perspective, is, as you mentioned before, we, ha we have this mission statement of empowering every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And there's 7.8 billion people on this planet, but every single one of those 7.8 are unique. And this is truly where diversity comes together. It's those characteristics that you're born with and those things that you acquire throughout your life. And too often organizations are focused on, oh, I need to do something for female representation, or I need to do something for LGBT, or I need to do something for disability. And race is still a little bit of a taboo subject, but we need to start that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Instead of as well challenging ourselves of thinking about some of the intersectionality, and where actually from a diversity point of view, we've got to think about the different needs of human beings. Tied to that, there then has this build to think about, unless we truly understand diversity, we will never be inclusive because otherwise we will only be inclusive for those characteristics we're looking at and we're looking for. So it's well known, and I'll probably be a little bit of controversial to say this, in many LGBT networks in, around the world, um, the majority of members are white members we still have a race issue yep. within our LGBT networks. If we think about generation issues, we still have a generation issue specifically for the L and B and uh, um, LG and B community of many senior leaders feel uncomfortable of coming out because of they've lived many years having to cover who they were to be effective leaders and now feel they're gonna break down those stereotypes. So, so my personal wish is we spend more time truly understanding what does diversity mean to then be inclusive 
versus to rush to be inclusive of those things that we know. And back to Alex's point right at the beginning of this call, we have a, a very big issue at the moment, and it is a big issue around the world on race and, and the treatment of black um, individuals. But that has been systemic over years that we've allowed it to carry on happening. And that's that kind of watch, drive and change what you can change uh, without yeah. running to a solution first. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's really valid. I, I sort of use maybe a three, three point approach to what you're talking about when I talk about the huge cultural diversity that I was referring to at, at the start, which is that, you know, I think awareness is just absolutely critical. Um, it's like you have to be aware of cultures and things like that, which, you know, we can talk to me on any topic here, but it's this awareness there, which means that you are conscious when you're, be it having a meeting, running an event or doing something, you're conscious that there are many. And by being conscious, it makes you naturally move to being inclusive. And I, I think, you know, that we, we can all kind of learn that as you go across any of these topics that we're discussing, that there is sort of this... Um, a uh, really important thing about being aware, you know, not, not just being inclusive or diverse in those, in those words. Mm -hmm. Now, sort of while you, are, uh, while you have the microphone, uh, Roland, um, Andrew raised a little earlier talking about COVID-19. Um, and I'm really, uh, really interested in getting your opinion on what do you think the impact of COVID-19 has been on LGBT plus communities uh, across the world? Wow, really, really, really great question. Um, I mean, COVID-19, in all honesty, has only just started to affect all of our communities, um, whether those people who identify as a direct member of the LGBT plus community or those members who have family members within those communities. Um, I think when I think about this, that there's several different things. Um, and if I think about some of the challenges that individuals have had around the world um, who potentially have been put into lockdown with their family um, who may identify as LGBT and have only just come out or not just come out but are then living in a confined environment where they potentially do not feel safe they do not feel comfortable they don't have the access to a network of people to give them support this is a very big toll on both their physical and mental well-being this kind of then builds on to the fact of we know across the LGBT plus community, the prevalence of mental health is and mental ill health is a, is a lot higher. Um, and this is often caused by the, the topic of covering and the fact of many of us have to hide aspects about ourselves and that's a tax to us. Um, and so without having the right social networks and, and being able to be connected with people that we resonate to and support us, that will impact on many people's mental health around the world and especially on the LGBT plus community. But then when I think specifically about some of our communities and, and thinking about um, some of our trans employees around the world, by going into lockdown means that you actually then get specific um, stopping to have access to some of the medical treatment that you need to transition, some of the hormone treatments and the insulin treatment in a safe zone. And I mean, we're having conversations in many countries and around the world, uh, including India, about how do, we, how do we get the balance between people having the right medical support um, that they need um, versus being literally trapped in an environment where they can't, can't get out, can't help themselves, can't, can't look after themselves because of society. And then the last one, which um, to me is super interesting and it's a, a great passion of mine, is the topic of blood. Um, and I know it's a bit of a strange one, but apparently my blood is not good enough. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit controversial on that, but the fact in many countries around the world, a gay guy or a gay lady or a lesbian cannot give blood, or if they do give blood, have to sign many, many details about when they last um, performed any sort of sexual intercourse with somebody of the same sex. And so this is really interesting when we think about COVID-19, that governments around the world were crying out for blood donations, yet the LGBT community were not able to play their part as much as they could do because of very historic rules that all of us are trying at the moment to overturn. We're doing a lot of work at the moment in Germany with the government there to overturn the historic rules about why our community are not able to give blood just as much as somebody who is straight uh, or who identifies, sorry, not as straight, as, as um, heterosexual. So all of these different things have, have components around COVID-19 um, we know that they're going to be ongoing components around the world um, because 
um, until there is a worldwide vaccine, uh, life will never become a, a normal, it will become a new normal. Yeah, yeah. Alex, uh, I'm really interested in you. I mean, we, I, I mentioned to you my uh, great love for Poland. Uh, and uh, Roland was just talking about different countries and different approaches. I'd be really interested in your views on how this has impacted the community. Yes, I really wanted to like jump in the topic of health issues, because as you mentioned, uh, people that transition are suddenly stopped from getting their supplies and that can reverse what they've already achieved. And that's can, that can be a huge, huge problem for them. That can also influence mental state of people around the world, no matter their sexual identity or preference or whatever, color of skin, gender, really. And I think personally that COVID-19 has shown us the importance of availability of things and most importantly of human interaction. Because to me, when I look at how I've changed during that period, I lack human beings so, so much. I miss people and to yeah. LGBT plus communities around the world not being able to enjoy and take part in Pride Month as usual, not being able to really be themselves. It's a huge problem and it's actually really sad to me, but I see a, light, a bright light in the tunnel of COVID-19 because even though we haven't been able to see each other for a long period of time, three months actually almost, I believe, we've discovered that we can help each other online we can create a network of support online and even you know session psychological session with psychologists around the world or simply with friends that we haven't seen for a long time now we are prompted to do so because of the covid yeah yeah really really good and in fact i think that uh on a on a brighter topic as well, I think COVID has also, at the same time, brought out some great stories and some great technology as well as to how mm. people can connect and, and possibly even connect more than they have, albeit not physical, uh, historically uh, as well. But um, uh, I'd be really uh, interested, Andrew, in your, uh, in your opinions on maybe some good stories uh, that you've heard. And, you know, I can name some, some great ones that I've seen as well, which, you know, from uh, dance parties to drag parades uh, to drink sessions on a Friday afternoon that have been held virtually, you know, to even, you know, mental health awareness um, activities that have been going on. And actually, I've seen these things bring the communities closer together in a difficult time. Um, and going back to that word inclusive, also more inclusive as well. Mm. So, you know, some really good stuff. But Andrew, I'd, I'd love to hear some of your stories or thoughts on some of the positive things. Yeah, well, interestingly, I know that um, Roland just mentioned around how people who are sort of locked in possibly with um, homophobic families or whatever um, may reach out to people on social media. And uh, for me, that's actually quite important because when I was growing up, I spent a lot of my time um, talking to people and made friends online. Um, I was bit of a geek who used to make websites and things like that and I think it was really great to have that community there and it's really nice that that's now become part of what uh, a wider um, society as well of people to be able to meet people find a connection um, I think for me one of the best actual good stories of something that someone's done is um, we all know Eurovision was cancelled this year uh -huh. uh, um, it's a key night in the annual calendar of uh, many gay people um, and at the same time we don't have those um, weekend club nights to meet up with friends etc and there's actually a, a guy that arranged um, a watch along of some old Eurovision contests and you would tweet along and um, it actually is the highlight of my husband's weekend um, who <laughs> is obsessed with Eurovision <laughs> um, and it did start out as mainly gay people who um, getting involved and it was then picked up by the EBU that arranges Eurovision and grew and grew and it's now 
there's thousands of people watching every week. It trends on Twitter every week above things like Britain's Got Talent, the biggest shows on our TV. Fantastic. Um, and I think that's a really great way of, um, I think Eurovision is all about joy. It's um, a great thing to get involved in. Uh, and I think that there's something about it that really made people feel that they were part of something. They got to look back at history. And I thought that was a really nice because it's not about it's not about COVID, it's not about the virus, it's not about anything in particular, it's just a fun thing to do, which brings you that little bit of joy that everyone needs right now. Oh, I completely agree, I completely agree. And somehow the Eurovision also, you know, in the spirit of inclusion included Australia, as you can tell from my yeah. accent, you know, so <laughs> just sort of merged into Europe for the purpose of having fun, which is perfect. <laughs> yes. Um, so, Jose, I, I realise it's been a little hard for you to get a word in. Uh, do you have no. anything you want to share about sort of good stories or anything that you've learnt about yourself as well through the uh, the period of COVID and living with lockdown and things like that? Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, how many months now? Like three, no? Alex, what well, you were saying, three. Very similar to Alex, actually, and Andrew. Um, I mean, for a period of time, I started feeling a bit lonely and, you know, you start isolated and then all the things that you had for granted, like going to the pub here in UK, and other activities were taken for granted really until suddenly that's it, you know, I'm, I'm on my own. And, and, and also I live alone in a small flat, so it's, it's even, yeah. and so, um, but the one thing that I really loved was the sense of uh, connectivity that we just had for those fortunate enough to have internet, for example, and, and, and the creation, for example, of my team, they created a virtual pub using uh, a technology online and, and they were and they play every Thursday evening uh, social games, and this attracted family and friends, right? Uh, so it's very very interesting to see all the creativity that's happening to actually uh, fill that gap of uh, loneliness or the risk of feeling lon lonely, right? Uh, so and, and and also there's a few things that that came across that that I observe with friends and you know mouth to ear. Like for example, it's not to make a publicity at all, uh, but there's an example of. A group that I came across called the LGBTIQ plus COVID-19 wheelchair aid. So very, very long. Uh, they can find it on Facebook. But those guys, I was very impressed on what they were doing on, you know, organizing. Uh, it's, 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 it's a movement to organize actually help on those that need the most. Like for example, uh, the shopping. For example, UK, you, you, you can, if you have symptoms, you cannot go out, right? And so they deliver food to the doorsteps. They they organize uh, support like hotline. Um, so it gives a warm feeling. So in the positive side, I think society is actually changing into a way to all the material is actually becoming less important and all the human side is becoming a priority today. And, and I'm enjoying this movement right now, that, that side of it, obviously. Very good, very good. Now, um, I don't want to offend any of our panelists here with this next part, but Miloš, I think you represent the younger generation uh, here on this call. I'd be really, really interested in hearing from you about you know how you have found sort of the various lockdown rules and things like that and what it's meant to you um, as a part of the community and and what it's meant to pride as well well the social isolation uh has a big toll on everyone i think uh and i found uh i'm finding new things about myself every day uh and it changes um uh, but i just want to i just want to say uh, that apart uh, that the pride is, uh, was cancelled in, in many places around the world and we couldn't really enjoy the pride um, because we, we can go out. Uh, I think that somehow the solar solidarity among um, people uh, observed, but on, not only for LGBT plus community, I think that uh, this event somehow brought all of us together uh, and for me the pride is not only the um, the call for marches and going outside with gay flags and you know wearing fancy uh, fancy things uh, but the pride and the, the gay parades uh, often are only the, the cream of the on the top and the coronation of the all of the hard work being done um from the year and i think that, that the pride covers uh two very important aspects uh one is being being for 
um, for us. <laughs> Uh, I mean, uh, this is why maybe this is why it's it's called pride, um, because we are showing people what we really are. There are many uh, false beliefs about the um, queer community. Uh, so, stepping outside our homes and going into streets, showing ourselves, uh, is breaking those beliefs uh, down. Yeah. And when our events being held online, sometimes we cannot reach people apart from people that follow our fan page. But still, I have to say that I'm really proud of our association because we managed to create an online version of our marathon in March. We simply were reading our you know, agenda, what we believe in. It was recorded by uh, board members of uh, uh, exactly uh, Equality Factory, but we put it online and many people were simply able to read it to see that we are still out there. And yeah, if I may uh, add something to how COVID, I, I, how I've enjoyed COVID during uh, yeah, lockdown. I would say that I really enjoyed the Royal National Theatre plays being put online for one week oh, yeah. because apart from yeah, my activism, I'm really into art modern art and theater. And from the LGBT plus community, I've watched many, many burlesque performances online. And that's something that I've really enjoyed, yeah. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. In fact, I have been just so um, uh, impressed with the artistic community in general, in, and in many ways, right, right from top to bottom in terms of how much is paid, to different people that you know people who are used to these huge checks and things like that coming together and, and rallying behind and, and releasing things i think it's been fantastic and it's a great way in uh isolation uh to be able to appreciate this kind of stuff yeah now andrew you've been uh, you've been very quiet anything you wanted to add to this i can see roland's ready to jump in as well <laughs> <laughs> uh, i thought it was interesting um what i said about um that Pride is usually a chance for us to show ourselves. And I think um, one thing that's been really interesting is, um, and I do this a lot, uh, COVID's given me the time to sit and think. I mean, dangerous for me sometimes, my mind wanders everywhere. Um, but a lot of people have also taken the time to, especially around um, with the, the Black Lives Matter movement, to actually post things on social media that help people understand things. And just um, coming on to the, um, how people see pride and how people may have otherwise have thought, oh, look, it's at the LGBT community with their special treatment again. And it's like, well, actually, that's not what it is. We're as actually asking for the same treatment as everyone else. Um, and I think actually, um, whilst obviously this is an awful time for, for many, there's, there's people finding ways to, to educate and explain why we still need to find ways to um, make a difference. We need to find, find ways to replicate Pride and other such events online. And I think the work that um, Alex, Alex is doing is brilliant because it's a way of bringing it to people and still making that point. We're not asking for special treatment. We're asking to be like everyone, be treated like everyone else. So I thought that was just something that came to mind whilst the guys were speaking. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I can see Alex put a hand up. Yep. Yes, I just wanted to quickly add to what uh, Andrew said that uh, online parades and pride events may be more able, to, more accessible to people not that come from not big cities that uh, are, you know, they live in villages and cannot simply commute to bigger city to take part in pride event. So I think that yes, I still believe that we should go out once it's possible but I know that our events are held in bigger cities and we are not able to simply reach all LGBT plus mm -hmm. communities in smaller cities in villages and COVID has shown that it's possible to reach out using online tools right yeah but then the on the other hand uh, the online world is not maybe not so accessible for I don't know people over 35 years or 40 years <laughs> i don't i don't know uh, how is it for you but 
in Poland we have those experiences that it may be hard for uh, older people. So I think there is no uh, a perfect solution, and there is all there will be all, all, always a part of people which are somehow uh, excluded. But I think that I've learned during uh, COVID is that there are many tools that you can use, uh, and maybe we just had to uh, think outside the box uh, and maybe rethink many many things uh, and new to I don't know gain uh, a new perspective. Yeah. Except you've made me feel very old now. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sorry for that. <laughs> right, I think we're uh, we're running close on time. So maybe Roland uh, or or, or uh, Jose, anything you wanted to add at the at the end here? Yeah. So so if I may, I I think one one of the I I, I keep in my own head going back to this quote that change happens in between, and a lot of time pride is used by members of the LGBT community to help um, educate a little bit about themselves and about and to break down some of those stigmas and stereotypes. But what we're not particularly good as a community is driving that change in between these moments of pride. And so almost as a little bit of a kind of a call to action, I'd be asking, what are we doing to have better conversations in our own job and breaking down some of the stigma? So one of the things I'm really proud about the um, Gleam Network in Microsoft, our LGBT plus community did, was worked with our gaming organization and asked them, well, what are you doing to do differently? Um, and so I think it's a worldwide first that a, a, a game is being released onto Xbox with one of the characters who just happens to be trans to try and break down some of the stereotypes about starting at, at an early age around the world, people are starting to see the LGBT topic more normalized and be able to talk about it. But then on the same time, that's not just like a revenue generating component. We also have a brand responsibility to be able to drive change across all our supply chains. So all of us have an accountability to go to our respective benefits teams, our respective HR teams. They're going to get very upset by this statement and ask them, what are we doing truly on inclusive benefits? Yep. Not just for us as an individual, but how are we educating around the world some of these healthcare providers that currently don't offer a standard to corporations as small businesses, standard 101 things that the non-LGBT community get as, get as norm. And so by brands coming together, by voices asking these things, we can have influence on our healthcare providers, our services providers, even our supply chain of buying products and service from more LGBT friendly or LGBT plus owned companies to, to really try and come together and actually create this systemic change. That's kind of my, my kind of push on this. And it's constantly when I, when I talk to different people from the LGBT community about pride, I love pride. I think pride is brilliant, but it's how do we actually evangelize this day in, day out with everything we do and not staying quiet, but just ask the questions and become a constructive pain as it were, on this topic. Yeah, I think that's a really important. Um, Jose, anything you wanted to add? Well, I got um, I got my thunder stolen right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that question actually, not not, not so well uh, eloquently uh, put. Um, but my question is more. It was on the lines of, yeah, great. You know, we have pride. It's this great moment. We're all happy. What well, is wait for next year? Um, and you know, to an extent, in every single company I work for, uh, this has been the case a bit. Even though there were uh, groups and communities behind the scenes, they were not as vocal or visible or uh, active. It was like a calendar event. And and, and I agree with uh, with, with you. Um, There's something that we need to reinvest as much as we can within the, the the time constraints we all have right in our busy lives. But but it's something that it should not be waiting for the month of June. It should be something that if there's charities we need to invest, if there's uh, advocacy that we need to do, we do so. If there's uh, awareness in the sense of training for leaders on vocabulary that they can use that is more neutral, more inclusive, more more friendly, uh, then we should definitely do so, right? Um, and so, so yeah, so a plus one. <laughs> so it's the lame one, but that was exactly going to to go through that. So so thank you, Ron, for for leading it. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I think, uh, you know, the fact, you know, here we are sort of at time, I feel like we could go on and on and talk for hours about this topic. And, you know, I think it's, um, it's to me, 
I think it's answered the, the first question, which was sort of, does pride still matter? I, unquestionably, yes, is, is what I've just heard. Absolutely. And it's not just it in itself, it's the message it sends to the community as well about this inclusive uh, mindset uh, as well. So yeah, really happy. Thank you so much to the panelists for contributing. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, you know, I look forward to, uh, to being in touch soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. Pleasure.